Hare Krishna, uh, very dear devotees, welcome back once again to our ongoing series uh, on the glories of our most beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Goravani Pacharine, Ivishesha Shunyavari Pastrata Deshatarane. In glorification of um, Sridhar Prabhupada, who I often say is the uh, revealer of the Dham, I'd also like to uh, include a prayer here by the um, famous Vaishnav poet Surdas. He writes very beautiful. I offer my obeisances to my spiritual master who gave me beautiful Kantimala, effulgent tilak, the beautiful form of a devotee, and who offered me his shelter. <clears throat> In one of his hands, he is holding my hand, and with his other hand, he is holding the lamp of knowledge, which helps me to cross over this dark ocean of the material world. Surdas says, my guru deserves the greatest respect because only he can rescue one in the blinking of an eye. I bow down to him again and again and again. Oh, glory to Prabhupada. <clears throat> so, exciting news. Today we're um, actually starting a, a new series entitled Stimulation for Ecstatic Love. Stimulation for Ecstatic Love. And this will be uh, part one. This is actually, as many of you know, the title of uh, chapter 26 of Sridhar Prabhupada's Nectar of uh, Devotion, which of course we know is a summary study of Sridhar Rupa Goswami's uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Chapter 26 of Nectar of Devotion is a study of things which um, help <coughs> to stimulate or awaken our love for Krishna. Sridhar Prabhupada introduces that chapter by writing as follows, quote, Some things which give impetus or stimulation to ecstatic love of Krishna are his transcendental qualities, his uncommon activities, his smiling features, his apparel and garlands, his flute, his buffalo horn, his leg bells, uh, his conch shell, his footprints, the places uh, of his pastimes, such as Vindavan, his uh, favorite plant, Tulsi, his devotee, and the periodical occasions for remembering him. One such occasion for remembrance is Akadasi, which comes twice a month on the 11th day of the moon, both waning <coughs> and waxing. Prabhupada continues, <clears throat> on that day all the devotees remain fasting throughout the night and continuously chant the glories of the Lord. Hare Krishna. Prabhupada's description of this, uh, that chapter in Nectar of Devotion. So in this new series, we will discuss a number of these articles, like uh, Krishna's flute, uh, his peacock feather, his different uh, types of crowns, uh, his, his stick for controlling the cows, his buffalo horn, <laughs> there's lots of things as well as Srimati Bhadarani's paraphernalia. <clears throat> her paraphernalia like her shringar, her, her jewels, um, her braided hair, her red uh, foot lac, etc. We will discuss uh, the origin of all these things, what role they play in the divine couple's service, what our acharyas like Sri Goswami have to say about them, etc. <clears throat> we'll also hear that the glories of, of these articles, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little cold, <clears throat> in the poems of uh, famous devotee poets like Surdas, uh, Mirabai, and many others, etc. We'll do our best to study these things from every angle. Vedic scholars, I was reading, say there are three angles by which something can be studied or viewed. It's really interesting. The first one is known as Simha Avlokana. Simha Avlokana, or <clears throat> the view of a lion, whose vision is limited to seeing straight ahead or behind him. 
The second view that's mentioned in our Vedic literature is known as Kapot Avalokana. Kapot Avalokana. It's the, um, the view of the pigeon, whose vision is a little more broad, broadened, because uh, the pigeon is able to turn his neck quite liberally and see objects pretty much all around him. But the third and most perfect vision is Vihanga of Lokana. This is um, the bird's eye view from above, in which one has the advantage to see everything below very clearly. And this is the view of our Acharyas, who, by dint of their pure hearts and, of course, the mercy of the Lord, are able to see and, what's more, realize all spiritual matters perfectly. <clears throat> it is such Acharyas like Prabhupada and Rupa Goswami who will enlighten us uh, in our study of stimulation for ecstatic love. <clears throat> so, we'll begin today with a most favorite article, you could say paraphernalia of Krishna, and that's his flute. His flute. <laughs> we see here, I'm in Mayapur now, but we see here in the temples of India, especially in Vrindavan, well, everywhere actually in India, and in ISKCON centers around the world, we see Krishna standing on the altar in a beautiful Turibanga, a uh, threefold bending form, playing a flute. Sometimes I think when I'm standing in front of the deity, I, I say, I would, if only I could hear that flute. Maybe you've thought like that too. If only I could, I'm seeing the flute for many years now, I'd like to hear the flute. So there's a famous, uh, another famous Vaishnava poet whose name was uh, Parmanda Das, Parmandas, and he has given us a hint of what happens uh, to those fortunate souls who can hear it. If you can hear the flute, this poet describes what happens. He, he writes very beautifully. <clears throat> o Saki, when Krishna places the flute to his sweet nectarian lips, at that time all people, demigods and living beings who are fortunate, stop breathing in excitement. As he starts playing it, filling it with his transcendental breath, all living beings who can hear it properly and demigods become intoxicated. When he comes to the fifth note, all the ecstatic symptoms start to appear in those fortunate enough to hear it properly. And when he plays the seventh and highest note, I didn't know there was a seventh, and highest note of his flute, he enli enlivens the soul of everyone. O oh, Saki, what more can I say? With the last note of his flute song, all the kings place their royal crowns at the feet of the flute. Beautiful ladies surrender their beauty to it. Demigods offer their powers to it. And Saraswati becomes a maidservant to it. I, Pamanandas, also offer my everything to that flute who can drown the entire world in ecstasy. We have to thank that poet. <laughs> we have so much gratitude to express in Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in uh, <clears throat> the illustrious uh, Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, Sri Rupa Goswami describes Krishna's flute as follows. Quote, As far as his flute is concerned, it is said that the vibration of this wonderful instrument was able to break the meditation of the greatest of sages. Krishna was thus challenging Cupid by advertising his transcendental glories all over the world. Rupa Goswami's description. <clears throat> and of course, Lord Brahma, uh, the first guru in our, in our Sampradaya, also mentions the flute in his immortal Brahma Samhita, uh, 5.30. He says, I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is adept uh, in playing on his flute, whose blooming eyes uh, are like lotus petals, with head uh, bedecked with peacock's feather, with the figure of beauty tinged with the hue of blue clouds, and his unique loveliness charming millions of cupids. It's very poetic, but you know it just resonates with our hearts after so many years. You know, when you hear that, it's very poetic. Uh, 
little difficult to recite because it's fancy English, <laughs> but you know, we know it because we heard it so many times being devotees in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <clears throat> so therein we hear about Krishna's flute. Now, <clears throat> in, in my studies, I, I came to understand there's three principal kinds of flutes used by Krishna. There's the Venu. <clears throat> this flute is very small, not more than six inches long, with um, six holes for it's described uh, whistling. <laughs> That's how it's described in the scriptures. Six holes for whistling. Then there's the Murali. Murali is about um, 18 inches long, uh, with a hole at the end and four holes on the body of the flute. And it's described this kind of flute produces a very enchanting sound. Then there's the Vamsi. The Vamsi flute is about uh, 15 inches long with uh, nine holes in its body. Now, <clears throat> all these flutes are often bedecked with jewels. Uh, sometimes they're made of marble. Uh, sometimes they're made of hollow bamboo. And when the flute is made of jewels, it's called samo, samohini. Samohini. And when the flute is made of gold, it's called uh, akarshini. akarshini. Now, an, an interesting point is that Krishna um, plays different melodies on these flutes for different purposes. I didn't know this, but it's really nice. He plays different melodies on his flutes for different purposes. And actually, uh, there's a specific order that he plays the melodies in to accomplish these uh, different purposes. Uh, the first, uh, his first melody, because he plays different melodies for different purposes. So his first melody that he likes to play causes demigods like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva to break their meditation. And they forget everything in astonishment. With this first melody, it's described, um, Lord Anantadev sways his head like he's, like he's hypnotized. And the second melody that Krishna comes up with <laughs> makes the Jamuna flow backwards. His third melody makes the moon stop moving. His fourth melody makes cows run to him and become stunned just by hearing the flute. And the fifth melody, which actually we often refer to as a note, attracts the gopis and makes them come running to him. And the sixth melody makes stones melt and uh, creates the autumn season. Isn't this wonderful? The seventh melody that he plays, specifically, manifests all seasons. <clears throat> and the eighth uh, melody is meant exclusively for Srimati Radharani. In that it's described, it takes the form of her name and calls for her. So, uh, Krishna also has a flute named uh, Mahananda. Uh, it, it's, um, it looks like a fish hook. Uh, it's described that captures the fish of Srimati Radharani's heart and mind. Another uh, uh, flute which has six holes is known as Madana Jankriti. Madana Jankriti. And in um, Radha Krishna Gaudadisha Dipika, it's described that uh, Krishna has a flute called Sarala, Sarala, which um, is very unique. <clears throat> this flute makes a very low, soft tone, uh, like the sound of a softly singing cuckoo. Here in India, we hear the cuckoos. And you can hear them, especially in the morning, uh, singing very softly. So this Sarala, it makes a low, soft uh, tone like the sound of a softly uh, singing cuckoo bird. And Krishna really likes this flute. He's very fond of playing this flute in, flute in the ragas of Gaudi and Gajhari. I don't know those ragas, but those of you who are connoisseurs of music, Gaudi and Gajhari, he uses that flute for that purpose. <clears throat> now an interesting phenomena of Krishna's flute playing is that the sound of the flute can only be heard by the person or the party for whom it's intended. 
you know, Krishna plays for a particular person or a particular group, and only those persons or that person can hear. This is the mystical nature of Krishna's flute playing. He's the master of all mystics. For example, if Krishna plays his flute for his cows, only the cows can hear it and no one else. And if Krishna plays his flute for the gopis, only the gopis can hear it and no one else. And when the gopis hear the sound of Krishna's flute, they often abruptly leave their household duties and run out to meet Krishna in the forest. And I was reading, uh, other family members can't comprehend what suddenly happened to the gopis and where they went to. But they couldn't hear it. Like, where are you going? What, why? <laughs> I was reading that sometimes a gopi is only like halfway through cooking a, a, a roti, for example, and when she hears Krishna's flute. So she runs out of the house, leaving her husband waiting for the roti to arrive on his plate. <laughs> but the husband couldn't hear the flute, so he doesn't know what's going on. Really mystical. Only Krishna can do this. Uh, for cows, Krishna uh, he uses the flute. Krishna, um, uh, for cows, Krishna sits atop, uh, we've discussed many times, Krishna sits atop, for example, a tree at Terkadamba. Terkadamba, that's where um, Nanda Maharaja's um, original uh, barn is, or Goshala. So when it's time for the cows to come home, there's lots of kadamba trees there at Terakadamba. So Krishna climbs up uh, a, t uh, a tree at Terakadamba, kadamba tree, and he plays his flute to all to call all the cows home. But with, with his flute, he actually calls each and every one of them by their names. He can play their names on his flute. So he plays the names like that, like uh, Chandurika, Devali, Ivali. These are some of the names that I remember of Krishna's cows. And when he plays his flute for each cow, he plays their name, only that cow is able to hear her name. Only that cow is able to hear her name. All the other cows can't hear. She hears it through the sound of Krishna's flute. And I was reading, she gets delighted to hear her name being called by Krishna and comes running towards him. <laughs> so we can see that Krishna's flute plays a very integral part in, in his pastimes. So much so that he's known by names based solely, how could you say, uh, on his relationship with his flute. Like for example, he's famously known as Venu Gopal, Bansilal, Murali, and Murali Dhar. These are names connected to his flute, like that. So now, <clears throat> um, what else? Oh yeah, in Vrindavan, the flute is Krishna's only paraphernalia, his significant paraphernalia. He has a buffalo horn, he has a stick, but they're just kind of used once in a while. The Acharya says his, his flute really is his only paraphernalia. Like when he's in Dwarka or Mathura, he has weapons like bows and chakras and things like that. What is it? When he has a bow, he's Danodara. When he has a chakra, he's uh, Chakradhari. But when he has his flute, he's Venudhar. Vamsidhar. What would Krishna be without his flute? <laughs> Sometimes you see they take the flute out, the pujaris, when the Lord's on the altar, for him to take, uh, to take uh, prasadam. And sometimes I've seen they forget to put it back in. I've seen a few occasions. You're like, wait a minute, where's Krishna's flute? He's Venudhara, Vamsidhar. So his favorite instrument, obviously, is the flute. While Vrindavaneshwari, Srimati Radharani, her favorite instrument is a lute called Kachapi Veena. Kachapi Veena. But still at the same time, I was reading, Radharani also likes to play a flute. And according to her gopis, she actually plays a flute better than Krishna. <laughs> um, I was reading, Rupa Goswami says, that the sound of Radharani's lute is so beautiful that it blocks the holes of Krishna's flute, making it go silent. Wow. And the music of Radha's lute not only silences Krishna's flute, but also charms its player, Krishna. 
who was, who was otherwise known to be uncomfortable. <laughs> so Srimati Radharani and uh, Krishna actually, they often play duets in, in performances. She plays the lute, Krishna plays the flute, and it's described, this nourishes their mutual love by playing these instruments together, like a little consonant. <clears throat> now the Brajavasis, especially the gopis in, in the rasa dance, they, um, during the rasa dance, they also play a rich uh, variety of musical instruments. But Srimati Radharani, even though she's the best musician, during the rasa dance, she doesn't play instruments, you know, because the gopis play instruments during the rasa lila, it's just one of the details. She doesn't play. She just prefers to dance. And when Radha dances, it's described, she's like a diamond surrounded by um, a, golded, a golden band of smiling gopis playing venas, madangas, uh, talas, uh, and, and kartalas, and other musical instruments. Isn't that beautiful? But as much as the gopis admire Krishna's flute playing, they actually consider Krishna's flute to be their enemy. Wow. Why? Because it drinks the nectar of Krishna's lips without any obstacles. Why? why? Well, because for the gopis, there's so many obstacles. Even to get to be with Krishna, what to speak to and enjoy the nectar of his lips. So the, the flute's always enjoying the, the nectar of Krishna's lips, so the, the gopis consider it their enemy. They actually consider Krishna's lips to be their property, according to Rupa Goswami, not the flute's property. Transcendental nectarian details. Actually, a leela. One time Krishna had an idea to play his flute, um, how would you say, in a certain way, uh, so as to attract the gopis to come where he was standing in the forest. He thought, I will play a tune that will bewilder and attract the gopis, especially Sri Radha. Then he thought to himself, I just need to find the notes to which those uh, girls uh, will be most susceptible <laughs> and to which uh, their senses will be attracted. So Krishna, it's really cute, he began experimenting with different flute melodies to achieve these, these, this purpose. So one day he played a tune that stunned his cows who gave up eating grass in favor of just sitting there relishing his, his flute song with their ears and tasting the sweetness of Krishna's face with their eyes. So that didn't bring the gopis or Radha. <laughs> so the next day, Krishna experimented with another tune. And this time the forest animals and birds were stunned. And like the cows, they all stood still where they were as if uh, they had, as described, had been confined within, uh, within invisible cages. Like they'd been confined within invisible cages. Didn't attract the gopis, Arata. On the third day, Krishna's tune attracted the deer which actually uh, flocked to him in mass. And mesmerized by his uh, attractive appearance, they worshiped Krishna with love-filled eyes. Now, I was also reading that, the, that the, the, the gopis, they were somehow aware of these practice sessions. <laughs> Krishna is practicing. The Lord is practicing. These practice sessions. And they told Krishna's mother, Yashoda, that Krishna was practicing. They said to Mother Yasoda, O oh, uh, pious Mother Yasoda, your son, who is expert in the art of herding cows, has invented uh, various novel styles of flute playing. They just mentioned that to Mother Yasoda. Now, on the fourth day, Krishna played another tune which attracted the demi goddesses from Shvarga Loka, who were so bewildered by that sound that their clothes loosened and their ornaments fell off. And on the fifth day, Krishna played a melody so powerful 
that all animate things uh, became unconscious. And inanimate, inanimate things came to life. Wow. On the fifth day, Krishna played a melody so powerful that all animate things, meaning moving things like you and me, became unconscious. And all inanimate, inanimate things, like chairs and sofas and pots, came to life. So the Acharyas say that um, despite all of this, Krishna's mystic potency playing his flute, the gopis remained unaffected. Still, they remain unaffected. However, the Acharya is right, but the river Jamuna was deeply moved. The river Jamuna was deeply moved. Actually, I was reading when the Jamuna River heard uh, this particular flute song on day five, I think it must have been, she stopped flowing and became completely bewildered. Her waves swelled and her waters trembled. Then, changing course, she flowed towards Krishna and offered lotus flowers at his feet. Pretty po powerful flute song. But unfortunately, that melody, like all the others, it didn't attract the gopis. So Krishna just kept trying new melodies, day after day after day, that mesmerized, I was reading, the, the clouds overhead and Vrindavan's mountains, even Govardhan Hill. So finally, 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 <laughs> Krishna found the proper melody, in, and just in time, because feeling separation from Krishna, the gopis were becoming frantic, to the point that their in-laws thought that their sons had married mad women. You know? Krishna's trying to come up with a tune, but the, the gopis are waiting because they always want to be with Krishna. <laughs> so they're waiting. What, what is this melody that's going to just drag his to his lotus feet? So finally he found the proper tune, just in time. Because feeling separation from Krishna, they were becoming frantic to the point that their in-laws were thinking their sons had married mad women mad with ecstasy. And we could understand, it's described, the most disturbed of all the gopis was Sri Rama, who at one point was thinking, well, how can I become a bamboo flute? She thought, Krishna's flute is fortunate because as a male, he doesn't have to be shy like us gopis. Thus it rests in Krishna's hands and transforms the nectar of Krishna's lips into beautiful music that causes the rivers to swell and the bamboo along the river's banks to shed tears in the form of nectarian honey. It appears bamboo can produce honey. Then she said, Vrindavaneshwari, Shemachi Radharani, she said, I pray for the body of a flute. I pray for the body of a bamboo flute, she said. I reject this body of a supposedly respectable woman. No other type of body can relish what the flute does as Krishna plays it with eagerness and affection. And she continued, The day I become a flute, my consciousness will surely ebb. No doubt I will forget my identity. But Krishna will remember me as a gopi who became a piece of wood from suffering and separation from him. No doubt I will forget my identity, but Krishna will remember me as the gopi who became a piece of wood from suffering and separation from him. Hare Krishna. Vrindavanaswari Srimati Radharani Ki. So eventually, um, Sri Radha and the gopis' <coughs> intense desire to be with Krishna <coughs> was fulfilled when they, um, they had a rasa dance. For when Krishna later played his flute at, at Vamsivat to call them for the rasa dance, uh, they all came running and eventually danced with the Lord for an entire night of Rama. Hare Krishna. This is like, I'm really looking, I'm really looking forward to this series. All this tadiya, it's called tadiya. Tadiya means those things in relationship to Krishna or his devotees or the process of devotional service to Dia. 
And they can be a stimulus and uh, awakening because of their potency, their attractive nature, they're being connected to Radha and Krishna. They can help to awaken our uh, love for the divine couple. So we're surrounded by all this paraphernalia. And um, yes, so we began with the flute. Actually, we have more flute pastimes to cover. So let's just say this is part one and part two. We'll continue with these um, flute leelas um, next Friday. And um, I'd like to conclude today with a statement from um, Prabhupada's Nectar of Devotion, uh, chapter 37, which is entitled, uh, if I remember correctly, Impetus for Krishna's Service. Beautiful poem there we find. Quote, in the Vidukta Madhava, there is the following statement. When Krishna was playing on his flute, Baladev very anxiously declared, just see how, after hearing the transcendental sound of Krishna's flute, Indra, the king of heaven, is crying in his heavenly kingdom. And from his teardrops falling on the ground, Vrindavan appears to have become a celestial residence of the demigods. Krishna's Vamsi flute, ki jai, Shri Prabhupada, ki jai, Shri Prabhupada, Prabhupada, ki jai. Once again, thank you, Prabhu. Um, yeah, I'm in Mayapur Dam. Um, today I'm going up to Ram Kali with a group of 50 devotees tomorrow. I've never been there. That's where um, Nawab Hussein Shah had his capital here in Bengal, and he forced Rupen Sanatana Goswamis into his service. So many pastimes. Sanatana Goswami was in jail, I, I remember, for eight months there. That jail still exists. So myself and these wonderful devotees accompanying me, we're going to go to that jail. We'll have one Maha Mahotsa Vakirtan. Visit all these holy places there. Spend the night and come back tomorrow. And uh, Ananta Vrindavan Das will be um, producing a wonderful uh, video for all of you. So you can also relish that uh, Leela Snot. Okay, so be back in um, in one week. Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Vrindavanishwari, Shimati Vadarani Ki, Maya Purdam, Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtan Ki, Nitai Gorni Tai Ki, Jay Jay Sisi Radhe Hey.